The problem this evening is one which I hope that most of you will never be directly involved with. For during many years, in which I have been a kind of last resort for troubled people, I've had much too frequent contact. Uh, with this situation, and I think it's only fair that it should be reported and recorded and preserved for those who need it or have a mind to accept it. We all know that the human being is at great, at great disadvantage in the presence of a mystery. We are able to handle the everyday occurrences with a certain amount of skill because we honestly believe that the adversaries that we face are known to us. We can measure our skill against theirs, and if need arises, we can run away and continue the struggle at some other time. But in a mystery, we are totally disoriented. The average person cannot function too much or too often in the presence of intangible factors. Even a little mystery arising in a family can prove to be most disorienting. Secrets are dangerous things because we, we have no way of fighting them. We have very little way of fighting gossips and poison pens and anonymous letters. They all involve certain elements of mystery. Things are intangible. We cannot face them and have it out. From the earliest time, man had more courage in the day than he had in the night. Even when he had his own private cave, this cave was a lot safer as far as he was concerned in the daylight than it was in darkness. After he built houses and put locks on his doors and barred his windows, he was still happier in the daytime than he was at night because in night, Perhaps old boards would creak or something of that nature. The man became afraid again. In our modern scientific life, man is afraid once more because he is afraid of formulas which he cannot understand. He is afraid of tremendous energies which he, he cannot cope with. They are all mysteries to him. We are a little bit afraid of the minds of other people. We do not know what they are thinking about. We are afraid that they are perhaps planning some secret exploitation of our resources, whatever these things may be. Long ago, man passed through a terrible nightmare, a nightmare of secrets and of darkness and of magic, intensified by a great common belief in the power of evil. The demons lurked in darkness at old crossroads. The fear of spirit possession, the fear of excommunication, of bewitchment, and all these things weighed very heavily upon some of our ancestors. They really never knew how to cope with them. They died as much of terrors of the common ailments of the flesh. So when today we observe the long shadow of mystery reaching into our private lives, there is a certain anxiety. We are not able to cope with the problem effectively. And there are certain questions that I think we all must ask. It has been rather well established by ESP researchers that there are possibilities of a certain kind of clairvoyance, 
the thought transference is very probably a reality and will sometime uh, be standardized or at least far better understood than it is now. We are more or less convinced that clairvoyance is within the reasonable probability of things and many different extrasensory potentials are being experienced within ourselves. To a degree, these discoveries are important and useful and helpful, and perhaps they will support our basic idealism and our, or our conviction that the universe is a far greater and more important place than we have ever learned that it was. But there's always this little lurking problem. So we can put it in a very simple words of one individual who spent quite a sum of money to have mental absent treatments. This individual was very anxious that a certain person that they knew should change their way of life. So they hired someone, a practitioner, to go to work on the issue. And after a reasonable length of time, the object of all this attention did make some changes in their way of life including a will in favor of the individual who came to me. Well, this sounded like higher mentalism, uh, doing a pretty good job. You would get testimonials very easily for such procedures. But suddenly the person who came to me broke out in a cold sweat. Uh, this uh, was a little problem. If they could change another individual and get a will in their favor, was it possible that some other individual could change them? While we were out mentally dominating somebody else, could it be that somebody else was trying to mentally dominate us? Do these processes work both ways? If it is possible for us to send our thoughts to change the life of someone else, uh, could someone else send their thought and change our lives? If we want to make someone else do something they do not want to do, can they return the favor in kind? It is one of these things in which uh, it was a good rule, but it shouldn't work both ways. Each person feels that he has a right to change others, but he doesn't like the thought that somebody might be secretly trying to change him. The moment we get into this problem, our freedom of action, our freedom of thought, all these things evaporate. Where will it begin? Where will it end? If one person can influence, influence us, so can fifty or a hundred or a thousand. If one individual can cause another person to have a loss out of revenge or out of spite, can somebody else cause us to have a loss the same way? Like the old bruja. If we can pray our enemies to death, can our enemies pray us to death? It just doesn't look so well when we open this mysterious door between the commonplace and the unusual. We step immediately into a world, first of all, a region which we know nothing about. We have no background in our own experience to cope with these intangibles. All we have to work with is a, is a tremendous tendency to fantasy in ourselves, an imagination that can get out of hand even with the commonplace, let alone the unusual, and a mind that has very little foundation in any form of essential courage or fact or reasonableness. With a nature, therefore, that is lacking in most of the requirements of prudence and common sense, it is very easy to get deeper and deeper into a world of wonders that can change gradually and inevitably into a world of terrors. It is a rather dangerous situation for the person to suddenly leave behind the landmark that he has and knows and depends upon and sail out into an uncharted ocean 
of mystical and occult possibilities. My experience with this type of situation is that 99 out of 100 land in shipwreck before it's over. They might be able to handle the situation with some dignity if they were very wise or very poised or very well integrated. But who ever heard of an individual very poised and very well integrated who ever got mixed up in these things? Nine-tenths of the potential victims of their own foolishness in this direction are themselves neurotic. They are persons whose lives have been in one way or another, unhappy, frustrated, pressure-ridden. They are not thorough scholars. They are not deeply thoughtful individuals, trained thinkers. They are persons who have drifted along through the years, studying a little of this and a little of that, joining this organization and then that organization and most of them in trouble from the mere process of chronic joining. So many of these organizations threaten their members that if the member leaves for any reason, some dark and mysterious curse will fall upon them. This is enough to wreck a life immediately. The individual living in the 20th century still has the old primordial instinct to be afraid of curses and afraid of the evil thoughts of others. And the moment we give these evil thoughts a large place in our own thinking, we can begin to feel these thoughts moving in on us. Our lives can become haunted by the mere fears that arise from negative speculations about the unknown. These speculations didn't rise as the result of certain interest in metaphysical matters. Uh, the individual would probably immediately consider the possibility that he's mentally ill. But if um, this is part of some strange mystical procedure, he doesn't think of himself as ill at all. He thinks of himself as illuminated. He thinks of himself as having reached new dimensions of consciousness. But then these new dimensions of consciousness begin to go to work on him. And uh, before it's over, we realize that he has simply uh, used this strange unknown as a catalyst for his own neurosis. So we can't uh, too strongly recommend that persons be extremely cautious in trying to explore areas where their knowledge is simply insufficient. Now, knowledge in itself is a very good thing. We should know about everything, even things we do not really agree with, or even things we do not want to believe. We should know about them. We should never assume for a moment that ignorance is an asset. There's a great deal of difference, however, between understanding the theories and practices of certain beliefs and the effort to dabble with them ourselves. There's no reason why we shouldn't understand the theories behind transcendentalism if it intrigues us. But there are many reasons why we shouldn't dabble with it. Especially, this is true, where we actually haven't even any very solid groundwork in theory. It's one thing, perhaps, to make some modest experimentation after 20 years of careful study, in which we really have done our own study, not simply taken somebody else's word for it, read a few uh, ancient books or modern reprints, but to approach these things haphazardly, in a strange, childlike faith that somehow we are going to be protected from our own foolishness. Uh, this simply does not pay off, except in terms of tragedy. Now, one thing that's not too important at this stage of our thinking is whether uh, all this weird and wonderful world is a reality or simply a psychological condition within ourselves. 
Whether all this magic is a psychic phenomena or a psychological phenomena is not perhaps so important at this point. Regardless of which it is, it has the same effect on us. And uh, when we add to this a certain amount of coincidence, a certain amount of inevitable fortuity, we can build up a pretty strong case for things that can be very difficult if we're not careful. For example, we know that the average person who doesn't feel well will likely enough feel better tomorrow. A very large percentage of symptoms, as every doctor knows, are not very valid. That's one of the reasons why maybe a couple of aspirin tablets or something of that kind will permanently remove aggravating symptoms which have no real essential foundation uh, in a true bodily condition or warning, a little fatigue perhaps, a little eye strain, uh, a little tension, and we have a headache. We relax and the headache takes care of itself and simply disappears. Now in the same way, for hundreds of years, medicine made use of the bread pill and other simple formulas, the purpose of which was simply to cause the patient to believe that he had been given important medications and the patient, completely relieved of his anxiety, got well. He didn't really need any medication at all. This is also the reason why so many patent devices during the middle of the last century were so successful like the magnetic horse blanket and things of this nature. This magnetic blanket had absolutely no magnetism whatever associated with it, but thousands of people reported amazing and miraculous cures. Uh, they also announced tremendous results from various uh, herb concoctions and swamp root preparations, the only medicinal element being alcohol. But naturally, it gave a certain note of encouragement, especially if the doses were large and frequent. <laughs> the individual, therefore, if uh, left to his own devices, will very often feel better, at least temporarily. But if an individual who has nothing wrong with him, except perhaps a little anxiety mechanism, uh, feels that he is being treated for this, uh, that uh, some other person is sending him powerful vibrations, he gets feeling better very quickly, just like he used to get feeling better on Peruna. It was, uh, there was a certain parallel here. And we come finally to really believe that people are doing a lot of these things for us or to us when we're really doing them to or for ourselves. But coincidence also comes in, plays quite a part in some of these things. I've seen it. And in a little while, we come to the conclusion that thoughts are very, very vital things, that we only have to send a few thoughts around, and the whole face of common sense is altered. This goes on for a time. What ends up, what ends is finally the individual becomes seriously ill with something and perhaps by neglecting it in the hope of some other form of magical cure reaches a point where he cannot be saved at all. These things have their mysterious negative factors that we have to watch for constantly. Because faith is a wonderful thing, but when it's put in the wrong place and the wrong things are believed in, it can be very costly in terms of health and happiness and life. One of the simplest uh, examples of what might be termed magic uh, that man has used from the very earliest time is prayer. Now prayer can be a very wonderful thing for the human being. It has a tremendous potential for good. And yet so few of us can use prayer unselfishly. It is so hard for us to, to really be sincere even in this. If we really believe that prayer is a power, then this power becomes the basis of a temptation of some nature. Power promises us things. 
And it's very hard to believe in power without trying to use it uh, to our own advantage or to the disadvantage of someone else. I know people who have spent many years praying that misfortunes would come to another person. How we can do a thing like this in the name of God is difficult to understand, but it happens every day. We also have a great number of prayers in which the individual is asking God to take care of things that he should be taking care of himself, not waiting for the infinite to step in and correct a commonplace situation that we should all be able to handle. Therefore, we have prayer, which essentially is a relationship with God, transformed into a, a kind of a basis of a, of a new kind of old age pension or uh, social security. Prayer becomes the basis of the gratification of very commonplace desires. We don't realize we're misusing it. We have the best intentions in the world. But when we start to pray that somebody else is going to let us foreclose a mortgage on them, uh, we're in dangerous ground. We're in very dangerous ground. And when someone stands up and testifies that as a result of prayer they've doubled their income, there's just a little doubt as to whether this is what prayer was intended for. Whether we really have a right to assume that some spiritual force in nature, uh, a force which has, it has as its primary concern the achievement of ultimates, the great infinite patterns of things, should be supplicated every time we have a headache or every time we have a, an appetite or a desire which we feel needs gratification. This, uh, this type of use uh, seems to lead us away from the essential integrity of life. And when we pray that somebody else shall be over-influenced in some way or another, uh, what about the other person? What about the individual who lost money so that our income could be doubled? Did the universe turn on him for our benefit? Was our prayer a means of dishonestly acquiring that which did not belong to us? Most people won't even bother to ask the question. They, they don't care how it's fulfilled as long as they get what they want. But can we assume that the universe operates this way? And if we're willing to assume this, what happens to our own relationship with every problem of existence? The moment we take the honesty out of the universe anywhere, we take it out everywhere. Either there are principles and rules in this world, or there are not. And if there are rules, we cannot break them, and we shouldn't try. And if there are no rules, uh, then our entire ethical life collapses, and we have no hope or no reasonable expectation of any kind of good end or constructive purpose in our own existence. The old Greeks brought this question under consideration. And the, um, one of them asked Pythagoras uh, how a man should pray. The old Greek replied, uh, never pray for, what you, for anything. Don't pray for the fulfillment of any desire. Because if you pray hard enough, your desire may be fulfilled and may be the destruction of you. In other words, we all know what we want, but only heaven knows what we need. And uh, where we begin to decide what we want and use various esoteric ways of getting what we want, we are defying that universal pattern which alone knows what we need. Therefore, it would appear that prayer has a function, it has a purpose, it has a reason. But that reason is not the fulfillment of commonplace desires. Prayer is a mystic relationship with life. It is man finding the source of his strength in a regular communion with the heavenly power that creates all things. Nearly all ancient prayers were hymns of praise. 
hymns of thankfulness and gratitude. It was very rare indeed to find in ancient or primitive prayers anyone asking for anything. It was the person uh, simply uh, stating in simple conviction his realization of the wonders of life, of the blessings he enjoyed, the wonderful privileges that he had. And he gave thanks to heaven for the sun and the moon and the earth and the seasons and the harvest. He was not asking, he was thanking. And prayers of this nature are pretty safe prayers because they do not involve any interference in the processes or order or reason of life itself. One thing I think is a very important, whether it be in mentalism or in anything else, in prayer or anything that even uh, seems to suggest a metaphysical factor anywhere in our action, and that is that whatever thought we think, whatever message we send, whatever prayer we say, uh, that let us have at least one regulation on it, namely that it be beautiful. Let it always be good. Let it always be something that if it so happened that it returned to us we would be glad that it had returned. That there is nothing in it whatever that could be hurtful or harmful or evil. That we ask nothing of another person, exercise no influence over another person, except to bless them, to wish them well, and to hope them the strength to be themselves. Asking that they do nothing for us, or because we want them to, but asking only that they have the insight and the understanding uh, to live true to their own highest principles. If we are very, very careful uh, to keep ulteriorness out of our thinking, we do not have to live with the consequences of it sometime in the future. But just as we have taken every new and beautiful discovery that man has made and finally used it to hurt man, so even the most simple and beautiful and gracious thoughts that perhaps we start with all too often are twisted around to find some advantage for ourselves or disadvantage to others. In times of war, both armies pray for victory. This cannot be. In all the problems of life, we seek to call upon a divine aid uh, for the advancement of some human concern. And this advancement is nearly always selfish. So another very safe rule in connection with all transcendentalism is to take the self out of it. I think this was the burden of uh, Buddhism. Buddha, of course, lived in India. The Brahmins and Hindus of his time practiced magical rites. They called upon the gods. They invoked spirits. And they did many other things of this nature. Buddha warned against it, as also in Greece did Pythagoras. He warned against it on the ground that all of these rites and rituals had something to do with the gratification of man. That the individual wanted power, he wanted wealth, he wanted security. And even when he uh, Faust-like bound some elemental to his services, as in the old legends, it was always in order to gain some gratification for his own ambitions or desires. One of the ways to take the blackness out of magic is to take the selfishness out of it. And in the ancient religions there was a kind of wonderful divine magic. The magic of illumination, the magic of insight and enlightenment. This mysterious and wonderful magic 
by which man seemed able at times to come into the presence of his God, to stand in the transcendency of the divine principle, to enjoy or to participate in a, in a wonderful experience was sometimes called cosmic consciousness. This kind of a diviner magic in which self plays no part is one perhaps a form of the transcendent uh, which may be permissible. But uh, the rule I think is safe to follow is that man is in danger whenever he is selfish. And the greater the skill of his selfishness, the greater the danger he is in. And if he uses any esoteric or magical means to gratify selfishness, then he is definitely practicing black magic. And black magic is a magic that uh, perhaps is not so black in itself as that it opens the individual to the blackness of fear opens him finally to a strange abyss in which he is captured in the very conspiracies which he would turn against others. There can be no uh, ultimate security in anything that is essentially selfish. So when we pray, let us pray as selfless beings, uh, praying for the common good not even trying to define what that good is, but perhaps uh, building into the concept of our prayer, our meditation, our contemplation, whatever it may be, that wonderful saying, a wonderful statement that seems to be so protective of all good, when turning to God in communion and asking anything of the divine, let us always include that thought, not my will but thine be done. As long as we do not force will, as long as we do not impose our will upon purpose, as long as we do not stand arrogantly, because our will indicates our conviction that we know and we do not know, as long as we are not arrogant, much will be forgiven us. But in our arrogance, we pitch ourselves into adversity. Always, therefore, our own purposes, our will, our appetites, our instincts, our ambitions must be subservient to the great cycle of laws under which we exist. Man lives in a universe of cause and effect, under the great laws of causality and alternation and harmony and rhythm. Man should not under any condition build into his life any concept which would inspire him to violate law. He should not set himself against natural law. He should ask for nothing that he is not able to earn. And he should in no way attempt to force any condition in nature by which he attempts to evade that which is his natural and proper destiny. If man must pray for something, as Buddha points out, let him pray for enlightenment. Let him pray that the only desire that is desirable is the desire for truth itself. Not the truth we want, but the truth that is. Not the truth we prattle about day by day, but the truth of those infinite principles which we can only dimly comprehend. We may not know what the truth is of a situation, but we have the right to inwardly pray that that truth shall reveal itself according to its own purposes, whether those purposes help us or not, whether they fulfill any desire of ours or perhaps go entirely contrary to our wishes. The thing is, what is the truth? And whatever that truth is, with that we must live. And we must hope 
that in the face of truth we will have the courage to live according to it, and not according to any compromise that may arise in our own nature. From the dawn of our history, men have struggled to dominate each other, to take away the works and profits of other men. They have conquered nations and spoiled and pillaged the earth. Everywhere the individual, he tries to use strength to dominate the lives of others by means of strength, by intimidation, by fear, by outnumbering or outwitting. The individual has tried to deprive others of their natural rights. Out of this procedure has come the entire tragedy of civilization a tragedy which continues today as it has from the beginning. And we cannot assume that any mysterious power which man may develop shall be considered as different from any material power by which an individual seeks to gain advantage over another. There is no difference except perhaps in the detailed construction of the instrument. But whether we try to take a man's goods from him with a gun or with a thought, we have committed precisely the same offense. Whenever we try to over-influence him, uh, we are doing the same thing uh, that we would in any action or procedure in which we lure another person into an unfavorable situation in order to cheat him, betray him, or deprive him of something. In fact, as we study the situation more carefully, we realize that just as our actions have their rewards according to their motivations and their values, that the perversion of wisdom, the perversion of insight, the perversion of spiritual resource is perhaps one of the greater crimes and carries with it one of nature's heaviest penalties. Actually, we are far worse off as living beings if we steal from a man by influencing his mind uh, than we are if we break into his house at night and rob him of his goods. We have committed a different kind of offense. In robbery, we have used common means. Perhaps the man was careless and didn't close his doors properly. Uh, perhaps also we were using the ignorance of our own lives in which we didn't really know any better. But where we use anything that has to do with sacred matters, anything that has to do with the immediate presence of the divine in any of its aspects. We are committing a peculiar and terrible evil. Therefore, to pervert the mystical powers of meditation, concentration, and prayer, such perversion carries a far heavier penalty uh, than that of physical robbery. We have now uh, created a situation which has gone into our psychic entity. Uh, we have dabbled with something which can destroy life and reason in every part of our natures. Therefore, we must be extremely slow and cautious in this type of thing. Now, we don't want to spend our entire time pointing out all of these mistakes that people can make because there are other phases of this situation. And we have to stop to consider the individuals who get into trouble who are absolutely sincere. Uh, many cases uh, that come along relating to psychic problems have not really their origin in any instinct to malpractice. They have many times their origin in the individual's desperate desire to grow. He assumes that growth means for him solution of something. He does have the one weak spot, the heel of Achilles, which has made it possible for him to get into trouble. 
In his desire to grow, he is usually looking for some kind of a shortcut. He is looking for some kind of a mysterious key uh, that will open for him an understanding or insight otherwise not available. So he is really seeking just a little bit selfishly and just a teeny weeny bit dishonestly, but he doesn't know it himself. He assumes in this case that the end justifies the means. He assumes that illumination is the end to which man is intended and that anything that contributes toward this is good regardless of the detailed considerations involved. So we have the individual, and it doesn't make any difference where he is or what school he belongs to. Every religious, mystical, and philosophical sect has had exactly the same difficulty from the beginning of time. Where it is the person who really believes that the esoteric truths of life are some kind of a secret and that it is possible to find the key, buy it, steal it, beg it, borrow it, do some way to get it. And that by means of this key, we can suddenly, to borrow a phrase from alchemy, unlock the shut door of the palace of the king. That there is some way, uh, a way in which spirituality uh, can be wonderfully augmented within the individual by some methodology. And of course, years ago, we had a deluge of methodologies. Uh, today, they are not so frequent, but there are some pretty intensive ones still left. And people are sometimes wrong in their judgment of these groups uh, they, are, they misunderstand teaching that is intended well, or perhaps the teaching itself is not well stated or well integrated and does not protect the student adequately. So we have a great many people who are in trouble simply because they are trying to be better than they know how to be, and that can get you into complications. This is one of the points that I have emphasized for very, very many years. That the average person cannot handle uh, the development or release of so-called metaphysical values or factors or forces within his own nature. He does not know when a development is legitimate and when it is not. And he does not know where some time, type of mystical experience begins and some type of wishful thinking leaves off. He just does not know. He cannot really tell the difference between a vision and a dream. He has no way of knowing the difference. For that matter, he doesn't know the difference between a dream and a nightmare. There uh, are many strange and difficult situations that the person cannot cope with. The moment his mind is, is separated from the commonplace, the landmarks about which he is reasonably certain, he wanders into a mist and mystery which he cannot evaluate. He really doesn't know what he's doing. Now, there should not be this kind of situation. People should not be encouraged or permitted to get into these difficulties. But we can't do very much about it now because the trouble started a long time ago. Back in the gradual collapse of classical culture, the various esoteric arts and sciences of the temples were profaned. These secrets were brought out, uh, initiates broke their obligations, or some even under torture uh, confessed or described things which they should not have discussed. In any event, little by little, what used to be a very carefully guarded way of life uh, became available uh, through 
uh, the dishonesty or the treachery of members or uh, novices in these subjects and uh, the old mystery sciences came into the common possession of mankind. Of course, some good was accomplished. It wasn't all bad. For from the temple we got mathematics and astronomy and chemistry and music, geography and history. Practically every science we know was originally part of this secret wisdom. Those sciences which we could turn and apply to the common advancements of mankind have helped, but because they were advanced without the obligations of the ancient temple, most of the secular branches of knowledge have become utterly corrupted, and all knowledge is now used selfishly. Whereas in the older times the obligations were such that the possessors of knowledge were bound to right use. This no longer exists as a general policy, unless the person by his own high morality makes a voluntary obligation. But some of the other more secret and mysterious arts were brought out of their ancient symbolisms <coughs> and from the early sanctuaries of the mysteries. Pandora's box was opened all types of psychic and magical phenomena came to be a little better known and a little better understood than was wise. But the great over-science of which it was a part, the great dedications to the temple which once protected it, the long periods of purification and preparation which once led to the revelation of it, all of these guards and protectors were lost and the individual uh, was in much the same condition that we were when we discovered nuclear fission and had in our hands the greatest power that man has ever materially possessed and practically no ethical structure to direct the use of it. This was a situation that was uh, rather serious. And as far as the private citizen is concerned, the esoteric arts are just as dangerous as nuclear fission. He can get himself into a private dilemma uh, just as easily as the world could be forced into a dilemma uh, by an atomic war. But without the guides and guards around these practices, we developed a whole series of popular systems by which the individual really tried quite sincerely uh, to advance his own internal life. He was convinced that somewhere inside of himself was a God, a tremendous power, and that this divine principle within him was stronger than his personality, stronger than his mind and his emotions and his body, and that in some way there was a great security, a great uh, sufficiency to be achieved if man could explore this inner nature of himself and come finally into union with the divine power the source of his own being. Thus systems and schools were set up for the exploration of these secret processes. The theory was legitimate. The procedures were to varying degrees legitimate. Some quite definitely had strong good points. Others had very few good points. Many of the names that were used to identify these systems were ancient, honorable, belonged to great schools of the past. Some were out of fabrications and proclamations of the mysteries. Who knew? Who was able to tell which was genuine and which was not genuine? not one in ten thousand who became involved in these various procedures. Everybody had to believe somebody and most people be believed the wrong people. So we had more trouble. Trouble because of sincerity, finally. But trouble because sincerity was not very smart, not very wise in its attitude toward these matters. Every day, whenever a new system comes along, there's somebody who jumps into it 
gets himself into trouble and uh, gives the whole theory a bad name. Always the same problem is involved. Every great system of enlightenment the world has ever known has accepted the essential inevitability of universal law. The great disciplines of the mysteries were based upon the law of cause and effect, just as much as the most common occurrences of living. And all of the great steps and stages of the development of man's inner life, these degrees of development were the results or effects of causes and the causes had to be right, and they had to be exact, and they had to be complete, or the effects would not be uh, what, was what was required or expected or hoped for. So in the whole theory of man's spiritual growth, all growth arose from the unfoldment of personal integrity. The beginning of all mystical discipline was the purification of the individual's life. Purification did not mean to uh, imply that the individual could get nowhere unless he was spotless. Purification meant that the search for reality had to be genuine. It had to be real. It had to represent a dedication to principle. It certainly had to mean that the common difficulties which beset us have to be met and understood and fulfilled according to the workings of law. So we have today a great many people who are trying desperately to develop certain extrasensory perceptions. Most of them get in trouble. They get in trouble for, for many reasons. First, because they do not understand how to develop anything. They have to hope. They have to pray. They have to follow some strange, mysterious pattern and have some kind of faith that it will work. Well, many times, of course, they are following patterns given them by others. And here, we frequently hear the wonderful accounts of the secret instructions that folks have received. And many of these instructions are appalling. Uh, they represent the most colossal ignorance and effrontery on someone's part. I've checked a great many of these wonderful revelations of how to develop extrasensory powers, how to become an adept in five or ten lessons, how to uh, look through solid walls and see what's going on on the other side, how to multiply the family fortune, make friends, influence people, dominate situations, almost anything you want. But even apart from these, which some folks are a little too smart to fall for anymore, there are uh, these mysterious procedures which are supposed to be shortcuts to the infinite, by which the individual is all the quicker and the uh, uh, more simply directed uh, to some type of illumination or mystical experience. I have tracked down a great many of them. Uh, sometimes they're in pamphlets and literature, sometimes they're carefully guarded secrets, communicated only uh, from one person to another under the most direful obligations. But where did they come from in the first place? Where do these instructions originate? And I have checked a great many of them, and nearly all of them begin in somebody else's psychical aberration. That is the 100% causing ground for most of them. You finally get the individual who apparently was the pioneer in this particular form of the matter, you pin them down as to where they got this secret discipline that was to save the world. Who told them? Uh, what uh, secret or ancient society did they belong to? 
Uh, where was the line of descent on this knowledge? Where did the information come from? Uh, in almost every instance, this information was something that had been given to them in a dream, in a nightmare, in a bad moment of some kind. Often it was nothing but a slightly twisted paraphrase of something they had read. But they hadn't consciously taken this thing they had read and passed it on as their own. They really hadn't. But they had been reading about it for some time, and one night they dreamt about it. And it got a few extra flourishes in the processes of the dream, and the next morning a new religion was born. <laughs> and this is how it started. And people, quite convinced of the sincerity of the source, and the person at the beginning probably actually rather sincere, everybody in trouble within six months, because the situation was not bona fide. There was nothing. The only way in which the individual could get anywhere with the instructions he was receiving was to develop so powerful an imagination that he had hallucinations of progress relating to himself. He could imagine himself to be illuminated. In fact, if he was real good at it, he could have a dream somewhere also in which the cosmos opened up and he found himself seated in the midst of the infinite. But the whole thing ended up in a dream. It ended up in a in a strange, negative, psychic situation. Well, you can say if it made the person happy and didn't do anybody else any harm, and uh, everyone seemed to be getting along a little better than they had before, why upset the apple cart? If that's what they want to believe, if we live in a land where you can believe almost anything you want, why not uh, let them go on believing? Well, if it went along nicely like this and everything remained happy, that wouldn't be perhaps so bad a situation. But it never goes that way. In a very short time, the false doctrines, the false ideas, uh, the, the stupid situations that arise begin to create complications. The individual who thinks he is illumined insists on illuminating other people. He doesn't know much himself, and by the time it passes on to a number of others, it's worse than when he got it. He begins to uh, have pre-warning of various events. He frightens people to death. He has visions of uh, what is going to happen to the universe, the political system, and the neighborhood. This becomes very complicated. And also, little by little, he becomes a metaphysical aristocrat <laughs> on his own part. There is this note of infallibility about him. After he's had this a little while, he loses his family, his relatives, and his friends, who cannot put up with this concept of an infallible person who is making as many mistakes as he ever made, but isn't admitting them anymore. The individual suddenly discovers, or doesn't discover, but others discover for him, that he has stepped out of the stream of life's experience. He has new and fancy meanings for everything that happens. These meanings are no longer of any use to him in helping him to grow. As one individual told me, he said, why should I experience how to grow? I've already reached perfection. <laughs> it's a marvelous way to feel about things. But as far as this person was concerned, they were the only one who had the slightest suspicion that they had reached perfection. This same person who was perfect was the same grand old gossip they'd ever been. This person had the same antagonisms, the same prejudices, the same uh, fanaticisms that they had always had. Their temper was just as bad as ever. The only difference is that they had the same faults, but now they were blind to them, and this is no improvement. 
Or, as one individual explained to me, who had a certain rather bad dispositional problem that they had worked with for a number of years before they had become illuminated, uh, I asked them how they were getting along with this old problem that they had been fighting with for years, and they looked at me rather scornfully and assured me that a nasty temper was one of the proofs of advancement. <laughs> How foolish can you get? And they believed it. Little by little, all perspective was gone. Now, this isn't helpful. The individual keeps on going along this way until a situation arises in which they come face to face with an emergency in which the only solution would lie in the fact they were what they thought they were. That they did possess sufficient insight and understanding to solve a major issue. When this emergency arises, the issue is not solved because they haven't what it takes to solve it. Sometimes there is a very bitter disillusion, but it's a horrible thing to suddenly wake up and realize you've been studying for 20 years something that isn't so. Very discouraging. Also that in the moment when all these things were supposed to produce their miracles, nothing happened. There are these bitter and painful experiences. And we see that the person who starts off on one of these tangents never knows where he's going to end. Unfortunately, too many of them end with mental breakdowns. They become so involved, so tied up, they can't possibly solve the situation. Another painful interlude that most of these persons come in contact with is the fact that they are so right and nobody else sees it. This is very unfortunate. They know that they are creatures of destiny, but the world won't accept them. Under such pressure as this, they become antisocial, turn against the world. Uh, they, they feel that they are being persecuted simply because they're not agreed with. This can get to be a very serious source of mental and emotional stress. Almost everything that arises from these false, basic attitudes become in turn Almost everything that arises from these false, basic attitudes taking the life away from the simple dignities, the simple humanities that make things valuable. If, therefore, you are not careful, you can get into trouble. Now, here's another general phase of the matter which also has its problems. And that is the effect upon health. We've spoken about uh, a little about the emotional and mental stress of these situations. Now let's speak about the physical. The, uh, the possible damage that is done physically as a result of some of these procedures. Nearly all metaphysical practices involve a certain amount of stress. Uh, they create various kinds of fixed tensions of one kind or another. Most forms of concentration will do this in time. The individual, whether he realizes it or not, subjects his nervous system, particularly the autonomic system, to a tremendous amount of stress. The moment the confusion is set up in our relationships with life, the nervous system begins to flutter. Because the nervous system is very close to fear, anxiety, uncertainty, unreasonable hope, 
and the ups and downs of one minute of despair and the next minute of exaltation, the individual believing everything one moment and nothing the next moment, uh, more or less disoriented much of the time and becoming more and more hypersensitive, more and more defensive, uh, because he is increasingly misunderstood by everybody else. Little by little, his life becomes miserable, unhappy, unadjusted, tension-ridden, and stress-torn. And in a very reasonable length of time, the physical situation begins to reveal itself. It is very hard for the person to be under fear anxiety, or intense imagination without punishing the bodily structure too much. So these people begin to experience lack of normal body functions. Respiration may become erratic, various forms of uh, tacticardia may develop, Elimination may get very bad. And uh, most of all, we have the person who develops what I have often referred to as psychic flutters. This is an ailment in itself which is almost uniquely uh, due uh, to psychosomatic symbolism. It is the gradual development within the personality of strange, unexplainable miseries, as we used to call them, uh, particularly in the Deep South. They were often referred to as miseries, sometimes a little further north as agonies. But in any case, uh, they were difficulties. Where most uh, persons who have these psychic problems report strange feelings. They report uh, motions moving inside of them. Something like uh, nerve uh, filaments crawling under the skin. Uh, they describe uh, something resembling the grand symbolism of the metapause. Almost any mysterious, eccentric, uncomfortable, distressing feeling. They will have all the cold chills and hot flashes there are in the book. They will feel things moving up and down their spines, think their eyes are crossed, have trouble in swallowing, strange mysterious, mysterious moving migraines in various parts of the body. They will develop symptoms of arthritis one moment and of arteriosclerosis the next. They have many of them but they are suffering from palpitations, flutterations, and everything you can think of. And they are sure, almost certain, that these different things all indicate the presence of some kinds of strange entities that are creeping up at them when they're not looking, scratching them when they're trying to relax, whispering, unpleasant words into their ears when they're trying to sleep, tormenting their rest with dreams and visions that are not nice and not pleasant, and creating every kind of a nerve reflex that people do not enjoy. This is a very common group of symptoms. I could list hundreds of related symptoms in this area but I think we have summed it up sufficiently to point out the general theme. To these people, all of these symptoms seem to signify the presence of some other entity, being, force, nature, or substance affecting them. Perhaps they think that some of these mysterious feelings are of the people's thoughts bouncing off of them, or something. But there's always this type of thing begins to develop. I think the real answer to it is a gradual psychosomatic transference of total confusion. 
the individual has lost completely orientation. And perhaps we can imagine that the nervous system under such complete uh, psychic breakdown simply loses its own rhythms and its own orderly processes and begins to take on some similitude of the prevailing uh, lack of organization and integration. In any event, we find that a large amount of psychic phenomena ends up with this. Sometimes it gets so bad that there seems to be very little you can do for it. The, uh, the one thing that might help you can't do in the majority of instances, and that is get the individual to change his own mental habits. By this time, he is so convinced that he has no power over the situation that all he wants is a sorcerer to get rid of demons for him. He doesn't have any realization that these symptoms indicate the breakdown of his own natural integration. He is not mentally ill. He is physically disturbed, symbolically. All the mysterious doubts and wonders and hopes and anxieties that developed psychically are now playing themselves out nervously in the functions of the body. And this is an unpleasant thing to have happen. And the moment anybody feels any of these symptoms, stop worrying about what other people are doing to you and start organizing your own resources as quickly as you can. By organizing your own resources, I mean simply get your mind on practical, workable levels of action, train your thinking, control your emotions, find natural and reasonable outlets, and get your mind off of being spiritual because if you don't, you're going to have more trouble. Obviously, an individual in this condition is not spiritual. Therefore, whatever method has been used to get into trouble is not the method they should be following if they wish to become wise. So there's no use continuing the present policy. It is obviously wrong or the individual wouldn't be in trouble all the time. This, again, is a problem that affects good people, people who have tried very hard, but who have lost a certain sense of security. They have been thrown out into a universe that is too big for them, and they weren't smart enough to swim to shore as quickly as possible. And most of these people must learn to swim to shore and to start all over again in the effort to establish a basic groundwork for self-improvement. We often find that uh, other factors do contribute to this situation. Nearly every religious organization and most people involved in them become gradually more or less unnatural in their personal ways of living. They get into trouble this way also, unfortunately. We have all kinds of trick diets. We have all kinds of special exercises. We have individuals forcibly removed or deprived of the common expressions of life which have been theirs over a period of years we find them gradually developing various frustrations on the ground that the more frustrated they are, the more spiritual they are. This is a good way to get good and sick quick, because the human being cannot uh, take these inconsistent procedures without having some background for them. Now, it is true that every so often you will find a hermit or a, an old saint in legend lore or actual history, perhaps, 
was gone away into the desert, into the mountains, and into the forest, and there built his hermitage, and has lived peacefully and quietly apart from the concerns of man, and has practiced his Tao, or his Zen, or his Yoga, for half a lifetime in perfect peace and tranquility. Nothing unfortunate ever happened to him so far as we know, but sometimes we're not quite sure how far we know. But at the same time, the rumors are that he's done well. Now this is all right. It's quite understandable. There are people like this in every human society. There are individuals who are born for the cloisters and are never happy till they go there. There are people who have always wanted to live strange lives of unselfish dedication to other people. They're really most content in some field of religious service. They have uh, no strong attachments to worldliness. They find material living uncomfortable and unpleasant. They do not want to run away into doing nothing, so they would rather live in a dedicated service to some cause. And many of these people are very useful, and they do wonderful jobs. But they are generally useful and do well under the strong supervision of a system. And they become teachers of the young, or nurses of the sick, or guardians of the aged, or something of this nature. But they live and function, and their religious life is dedicated to rather practical, commonplace labors, which they perform in the name of their higher spiritual ideals. Now this, uh, in many instances, works out very well. But to take everyone, to take people from here and there and everywhere, and impose these kind of restrictions on them, will most certainly end in psychological and probably physical uh, disorder. These people are not so constituted that such a program is reasonable or practical for them. This is what happened in the development of Buddhism, where the southern school divided from the northern school. The southern school taught distinctly and definitely that there was only one way to achieve illumination, and that was to leave the world completely, utterly, and immediately, and never come back again. To turn from the common life to the robe, to give up every possession, to give up every attachment, to give up every worldly attitude, and even every worldly responsibility, and go out with a begging bowl and one small square of cloth, and keep on wandering and meditating, until consciousness or death uh, ended the procedure. This was not, however, the Buddhism that gradually uh, unfolded the great arts, the great cultures, the great mystics and idealists of the Mahayana system. Uh, man gradually came to realize that somehow the great spiritual truths had to be brought within the range of his common life. It became necessary for him to think of the way of liberation for the householder, that the father and mother with children and family and business had to have their part in this great pattern of enlightenment, that it wasn't to leave everything and to depart into the unknown but in some mysterious way to increase in grace, insight, and understanding every day, to find in the commonplace the source of enlightenment and inspiration, and also to realize that for the majority of mankind, simple idealistic devotion to principles was the wisest and best way to grow that sometimes if the person had the internal um, requisites, if he had brought forward with him from some previous life a degree of insight that called for the development of some extrasensory perception, it would come in due time of itself. And of course in the northern Buddhist system that was the last thing anybody asked for or expected. They did not 
practice their religion in the hopes that some initiation or mystical experience would occur to them. They practiced their religion because they believed that their religion was the proper way of life, that if they lived this and lived it well and kept the law, they would fulfill their responsibility to God and themselves. The whole purpose underlying this religious philosophy was not the unfoldment of the individual primarily. It was obedience to the law, the glorification of truth by keeping its rules and principles, and keeping them unselfishly, not in hope of enlightenment, but because this was the proper labor of an enlightened human being. Under such conditions, we do know that there were mystics, and great mystics, arise among these different groups. But these mystics were persons who had slowly unfolded. They had lived each step of the common life. They had grown skillful and wise in the philosophy of the doctrine. They had gone out and dedicated themselves to the service of others over long periods of time. They had gained practical insight as working with the sick and as helping to solve the problems of the burdened. They had become the counselors of rulers and the friends of princes. They had helped in the creation of good laws. They had helped to perfect arts and sciences. Many of them actually gave skills to their peoples. And Kobo Daishi, who was one of the great monks of the uh, Shingon Shu in Japan, is accredited with having given almost as many inventions to the Japanese people as Leonardo da Vinci gave to Europe. A tremendous genius in his own right. He was not a person who had uh, simply decided to be spiritual. He had worked and labored and studied. He had lived with the wives. He made the long and at that time dangerous journey to China in order to uh, come closer to the great seats of the doctrines. He was a master of knowledge, one of the most uh, perfectly informed men of his time and still regarded as one of the most enlightened men of Asia. These people grew sincerely. They, they gave everything they had to growth. And they grew not just simply for the sake of being wise themselves, but that they might become the founders of essential and practical movements and organizations. They were great mathematicians, great artists, great musicians, poets, men of literature and letters. And out of the, uh, the temples and the shrines and the sanctuaries came the great arts, uh, the great uh, modelings and sculpturings, the casting in bronze and in silver. These people were highly skilled. Uh, they took the attitude that the more able they became in everyday labor, the more completely they were able to express their spiritual convictions. So that uh, they worked with the law. They became better, realizing that the reward of being better is to know more. The reward of greater daily virtue is enlightenment. That there are really no tricks in this thing at all. By the time they reached the point as in Zen Shu or in the Shingon Shu or Tendai Shu, where certain esoteric disciplines were recommended or given to them by their teachers. Uh, these disciples were so well grounded in every principle of ethics, in their knowledge of the universal structure and the operations of all the laws of nature, that it would be virtually impossible for them to make a mistake. They had all the groundwork in, all the principles thoroughly established. Usually uh, in Zen, uh, not much of an esoteric nature was divulged under 20 years of discipleship. And that discipleship was more rigorous than anything that we can imagine. 
It was constant self-analysis, the breaking down of every illusion and delusion in consciousness. And by the time uh, the disciple was ready to go on, he had truly cleaned his own inner life. It was, it was well-disciplined and well-ordered. People uh, that have this degree of insight can probably be trusted, and you seldom have ever hear of anyone in this type of level of activity who ever perverted what he knew or contributed to the corruption of anyone else. These people knew, and they were able to use their knowledge wisely. What we are worried about constantly and, and stricken about so often is the dabbler, the one who really tries, but simply doesn't even have a comprehension of what he's trying. To him, uh, a few lessons and a couple of books, and he's well on his way to nirvana. Uh, it just doesn't operate that way. This does not mean, however, that the individual cannot grow. He can grow continuously. But he has to grow uh, with a dedication, not an enthusiasm alone. He has to grow uh, along the line which is the most difficult of all forms and that is self-discipline and self-control. I know more people who have tried to be spiritual without taking hold of their own lives. They can do almost anything you can imagine except what they should be doing, and that is controlling and directing their own conduct. These people are perfectly willing to devote a great deal of time to uh, wandering about the cosmos, but they cannot be patient as people. They do not know how. They cannot really be thoughtful. I know many of them that cannot even be commonly courteous. There is no attention to personal character. This is something to be left behind, to be hurdled, uh, to be uh, considered fit only for persons of less spiritual insight. There is no spiritual insight apart from character. There is no safe mystical experience apart from character. There is no possibility of man exploring the inner universe of value safely unless his own integrity is completely established. Any other course of procedure is bound to lead ultimately to difficulty. And because no one but the individual himself knows the degree of his insight, each person has to come to some way of judging these things. Uh, you cannot tell him that he uh, isn't ready. He will keep on going around until he finds someone else who tells him he is ready. And. Um, this goes on and on because the person wants to believe that he's on the verge of enlightenment. He doesn't want to be told he hasn't started yet. So you can't uh, convince people against their will. And yet, uh, because of this peculiar uh, type of religious thinking that has developed, uh, people just get themselves into trouble and have no way out. And by the time they realize the degree of their trouble, the very persons who got them into the trouble can't do a thing for them. So they wander about hoping for someone who can perform a miracle and rescue them from the dilemma into which they have gotten themselves. But this time, perhaps they do have a little experience. It will serve them in good stead in due time. But well, at the moment, they're in a very uncomfortable state about the whole thing. So we can only profoundly warn the individual uh, that when he starts dabbling with mysterious things, he must either have the consciousness to handle these things, or he should leave them alone. And no one who is frightened out of his wits by every psychic wind that blows is in a condition to handle the problem. 
no one who has to seek help is in a condition to handle it. Therefore, if this situation seems to be developing, there can be only one answer. Get out of it as quickly as you possibly can and get your feet back on the ground again. Uh, use the simple ways. Realize that this whole problem of what you might term psychic involvement is only possible at all because basically the person is not capable of thinking uh, with true wisdom. He isn't able to really think straight. Somewhere, weaknesses of his own have contributed to the fact that he was deceived or has deceived himself. It has to start with this. From that point on, all perspective can be lost, and the situation can just be a long, terrible hurt with no really, apparently, satisfactory explanation. But in the beginning, the person had to be foolish. And the only answer is to stop being foolish as quickly as you can. There are ways in which some damage in this area can be rescued, or can the individual can be pulled out of his problem. We realize that as the problem gets worse, as the individual advances in some form of psychic persecution, which is more and more difficult for him to get off of his own mind, he is inevitably becoming neurotic. He is becoming fear-ridden. Even if he hasn't reached a degree of hallucination, it may come any moment. He is certainly uh, actually frightened. He is living in fear. The whole thing has become a phobia. And this phobia is nursed. Fear is nursed by fear. The more he worries about his fears, the more he thinks about his fears, the more he waits for new symptoms to appear, the more frightened he will become. And if this goes on, especially if the individual is alone, perhaps living alone, where there is very little contact with other people, too much loneliness to begin with, which may have been a contributing cause in the first place, then this person must either make a valiant break with the situation where he finds himself, or he will not get out of the difficulty. And unfortunately, it is not a difficulty that will cure itself, nor will it get better unless something is done about it. Realizing, therefore, that as in the case of nearly all forms of neurosis, which may come from other causes, there is too much self-attention. Uh, the mind and emotions are focused upon the dilemmas of the self constantly. This means that little by little it becomes a 24-hour vigil of psychic self-defense against the unknown. The individual doesn't dare sleep. He doesn't dare do anything because of this constantly increasing pressure of fear, a pressure that is usually accompanied by psychosomatic symptoms that seem so real that there is no way, apparently, of explaining them except to assume that the psychic persecution is real itself. Under this combination, we have a hard, vicious circle which is extremely difficult to break. The best way that we can solve it is by starting out with the assumption that a pattern is no stronger than its weakest link. The situation is a pattern. If we can break it somewhere, we perhaps can break it everywhere. If we can just put new factors into the problem, or take old factors out of it, if we can shift the point of view, if we can change the psychic chemistry in some way, then the individual may be able to handle it himself from there on. 
So we have common things that we try to do to help people of this, in this type of problem. We try to find out anything that they are doing that is unnatural, unreasonable, or likely to contribute to the trouble. If these people are starving themselves to death in the name of religion, we suggest a square meal, but that it be taken slowly, because otherwise they may have dyspepsia. If these individuals have been practicing some form of syncopated breathing or something of this nature, they must stop it or the situation will not change. If these people have left the world because it is so materialistic and so unspiritual that it is constantly hurting their very, very subtle etheric bodies, we suggest strongly they go back in the world and reestablish contact that they've got to get out and get back in those good old low vibrations again because the high ones are killing them. <laughs> if these people have no interest in life whatsoever except waiting for the next psychic phenomena, we strongly recommend other interests. And we particularly recommend some form of activity which disciplines. If these people are retired on an income or are divorced and living on alimony and don't have to work, they're in a especially bad spot. These people have to decide that they have to work. They have to come to the conclusion that no matter what they have or how much security they enjoy, they will destroy themselves if they are not usefully occupied. We find then the importance of these people training some part of their natures. And the result shows how badly this training is needed, for so frequently these people are completely unable to take up any line of self-discipline without a massive struggle. These individuals cannot go back to school and take some adult education work. It's too monotonous. In other words, they cannot say to themselves, I expect to do this and I will do it. It's part of the very evidence of the trouble they got into. But you've got to get them out of it. They have to have new interests, new activities, practical outlets. They have to take up studies. They have to discipline themselves. If you want to play the piano, you discipline yourself. If you're suffering from a bad psychological or psychic condition, if you're unable to control uh, these vibrations that uh, may or may not be entities, it is simply because of lack of discipline. If you will discipline yourself somewhere, it will show all over you. Therefore, if we can get this individual who has never made up their own mind clearly on any subject in their entire lives, but who thinks they're just on the suburbs of heaven, if you can get this individual to go out and study music for five years, doing scales for the first three, and, will, and insisting that their own hands and their own minds will do this, or if you can get them into a group of Sumi painters and make them learn to make circles and bamboo joints on paper with black ink for three years before they're allowed to put a leaf on them, these people get well. Why? Because they have suddenly learned that they can make their minds and emotions do what is required of them. The person becomes positive. He has some accomplishment. He has some ability. In the, it usually takes from one to three months for a discipline to become a fascinating thing. The first two or three months, it is drudgery. But if a person really has some qualities within his own nature, he will develop a growing interest in the new things that are of interest or value to him. 
So if he can hold on for two or three months, the subjects will probably take over a large part of his habit mechanism. He will then go on and find that he has learned how to learn. If he will do this and gradually develop disciplines, he will then be able to turn these disciplines to the direct problems that are probleming him. He will be able to turn these disciplines to fear. He will find that he is able to control fear in himself. He will be able to control his own spiritual ambitions and realize that he's probably not quite ready for nirvana. He will be able to recognize that it is possible for him to go home into an empty house, perhaps, and build there a world of interesting values because he has become an interesting person. It is from ourselves that the environment in which we live must radiate. If we are negative, the environment is negative and afflicts us. If we are dynamic in ourselves, the environment in which we find our daily living becomes itself a dynamic source of inspiration. Everywhere the individual achieves his spiritual integration by becoming master of his own instincts, appetites, impulses, and fears. So if we can create in the person new interests, if we can cause this person to become more concerned over someone else than himself, I've known two or three cases of this spiritual problem in which the individual was suddenly transformed by an unavoidable responsibility. They suddenly realized they had a duty that had to be performed. They rose magnificently to this responsibility and the psychic problem vanished instantly. But there has to be something bigger than our fears. If we start correctly with our philosophic growth, truth is always bigger than our fears. But too many people live in a universe in which truth is lost. <coughs> The moment we stop believing in forces of evil persecuting us for no reason, we have betrayed our own faith in the universe. There is no other answer. But we do not know this. We can't think it through anymore. We have lost our perspective. We are simply hurt. And where we are hurt, there is no justice. We have to restore these values. We have to straighten them out and build again a pattern of positive conviction on which we can uh, live. If we can voluntarily reassume responsibilities that we have attempted to avoid, this will also help. It's like the young man who comes in to me and he says, I'm not getting any discipline at home. I'm now graduating from high school. I, I think the only thing for me to do is to commit myself to the Navy for three years and see what they can do with me. And the man says, if I don't do this, I will never be able to discipline myself. So perhaps for this young man, the Navy is the perfect thing, because at least he will come out being able to say, yes, sir, and no, sir, which is more than the average person can do. He will also know that when an order is given, he will obey, which the average child has not discovered. He also realizes that he's part of a team. And if he betrays the team, he is pretty much of a skunk. In civilian life, we don't know this. I have known several instances where young men have done this and have come back uh, a credit to themselves and their families would otherwise have been on the street and probably in uh, delinquency from lack of, dis of discipline and direction. So where we have a person who finds himself slipping into a negative psychic condition, we have the same thing. Put yourself under discipline. I doubt if the Navy would be interested, but there are other things you can do. You can create your own discipline. And you can say to yourselves, if I fail in this, 
then I know for certain just how weak I am and how far I am from the thing I think I am. Get these things very straight and very firm in ourselves, and we can generally defeat this psychic problem even after it settles in. But we can never defeat it by trying to use magic against magic. For the bigger the invocations and formulas and charms we make, the bigger the other side makes. And if we have the super charm, they have the super, super charm, and so it goes on to infinity. Because we are dealing with a thing so abstract, so elusive in its own proportions, that we really never know whether we have one or not. Under these conditions, the only answer is to take hold of the matter. If you are not in that kind of trouble, stay out of it and be grateful that it has been your wonderful privilege to be able to grow without seeing things. If you are seeing things, either have your eyes attended to immediately, or begin to dig into basic systems of thinking that are going to give you a dynamic, vital, meaningful pursuit in life. And under no conditions, if you are miserable, unhappy, defeated by life, run to some form of psychic phenomena for escape, because it is escape only into misery. If you can keep these thoughts rather clearly in mind, I think you will realize why it is not good uh, to dabble with this sort of thing. From an experimental stage, it is very foolish. It is like experimenting with uh, poisonous serpents or experimenting with some deadly material that is liable to explode in your face at any moment. Do not experiment. Uh, do not play games with life. But realize that if you really want to make philosophy your journey, as Plotinus said, build a solid knowledge supporting a well-disciplined, well-integrated character. Then as you naturally grow and properly develop any spiritual graces that you may require for your proper growth will be added unto you in due season. In this way, you won't have any trouble. Thank you very much. <laughs>